Well, 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 you have finally got here. You are listening to the Erskine Music Podcast. Here by popular demand, we discuss life, culture, Christ, and of course, music. These half-hour broadcasts are perfect for a commute, coffee time, chat, or any other gap in your schedule where you want to put great content. So without further ado, let's join the conversation today, already in progress. Get to it today. I try to do I try to do two for Tuesday, and I tried to do too much yesterday. And so we're gonna come back today. We're gonna do the one story, have our devotion, do what we normally do on this show. But you will get treated to the story. Man, this it brought a little tear to my eye. It may bring a little tear to your eyes. Well, comment section is turned on. Let's get it started. It's the Erskine music show all right without further ado my friends i told you that this show was uh going to be featuring this flying story and here it is we're way out in the aleutian islands Getting ready to leave and go back to Anchorage. Dr. And David home. Gibbs. And I had a speaker here. I had a ticket in my pocket to get on an airplane. The pastor came up and he said, Listen, I can save you money. I said, How's that? He said, I flew a small airplane up here. And I fly a small airplane. And I can take you in my little airplane and you can save your ticket. And this did not sound. I said, Gee, thank you so very, very much. <laughs> But I've got this ticket. We'll just make our way on home, me and this other lawyer with me. He said, no, 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 you got to do it. you got to do it. And against every better judgment I had, I said, okay. Well, we went out to the airport. Now, here's the first thing in this story. He did say against every better judgment that he had. The first time that I listened to this, I was like, some rando came up to him and was like, hey, I fly planes. Want to get in a plane with me? But when I listened to it again, I did catch that nuance that this was a pastor, a fellow pastor who was coming up to him and he was saying, but even still, <laughs> somebody comes up to you and the proposition is you can save money. You might die. You can save money or you can just stay the normal course. And I've heard of things like this happening when there's like a snowstorm or there's like something where the weather's, you know, not great and you got to get to a place quickly. I've never had this happen to me. I've actually never had anybody come to me and be like, hey, if you'd like to take my private plane, let's go ahead and do that. Save the ticket, you know, cash it in, keep the money. What was funny to me is apparently, since this is at a conference, pretty big name speaker, pretty well-known speaker, he felt like <laughs> saving the money would be the optimal thing. Now, that does factor into one's judgment motive here. I feel like as a more well-known pastor, he probably, since he already had the ticket, he didn't need to necessarily save the money. I can envision here again in the studios <laughs> with my cohorts, Big Head 1, Big Head 2, Big Head 3, and a round of people who are having this discussion were saying, you know what? We could save $127. Because that $127 might break us. It might be the difference between us paying the rent this month and not paying the rent this month. So let's get that $127 because the utilities are high. It's cold outside. And we've been running that furnace. I don't know how this plays out or how that conversation would have happened. But nonetheless, keep going. Took a spy his little plane and I looked at it. And I thought, well, one good thing, it's shiny. Then he walked around it. That matters. I'm not going to be stopping the whole time, but I was going to say that matters. Okay, first of all, I had the first bad idea, uh, and there was a time when I was traveling in Florida where I was just so fatigued. I had no place to stay, and I was trying to travel through the entire state to get to a show that I had the next day. The first time that I was in Florida, I didn't know how to schedule in the state of Florida because I went from Miami to, I think, Fort Walton Beach to do a show, and I'm traveling all through the night, and it's about 1 o'clock in the morning, and I'm reaching out. Airbnb and like I cannot go any farther what my rear end should have done is just sleep in the car <laughs> but I thought I gotta find some I just gotta lay down and so I got in contact with the Airbnb that got in contact back with me and said hey 
you can come and stay at my place. I'm a nurse. I'll be working. I'm gone. Here's the instructions, how to get in, do all the different things. And so my first judgment was, is this a good idea? And as I was driving into the area where I was going to be staying, I'm driving back down like some dark, deep roads, deliverance out there. The gators don't even go back that far. And my 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 mind, my spidey sense was going off. And my spidey sense was saying, this is not a safe area. If they should happen to kill you, they will not find you for years back here in these backwoods where you're at. And so and I'm going somewhere with this. <laughs> and then I'll let the story play out. Um, then I went into the house where I was said to be staying. And not only was it sparsely furnished, but it had these stains on the floor that they ultimately were Coke stains. But in my mind, at two o'clock in the morning, those were blood stains. And so I'm thinking to myself, there's not much furniture in here. I'm in the backwoods. Things are all over the floor. He told me to go in the back room where the bed is and to sleep there. Or I could sleep on the couch that's in the front. Hmm. What to do in this situation? At that point, I should have suspended the whole mission. And I should have gotten the heck out of there, but I did not. But obviously, I lived to tell about it. And nothing bad actually happened uh, in this situation. It was just, he was actually a traveling nurse. He, very eccentric human being. Um, he really loves Jimmy Carter. Made sure that I knew his love and deep devotion for Jimmy Carter, which, you know, that's different. Most people don't lead with that. Um, but those were actually Coke stains that were there. And there's some people that had moved out recently. And so there's not that much furniture there and like everything checked out. Uh, and the story gets a little bit funnier, but I, I do think it matters. Once you spend the judgment to say, you know, I'm going to save $127. I'm going to fly with this guy. He's a pastor. Maybe we'll talk about the Lord on the way. Okay. He seems like a good guy. Seems very genuine. Seems like very heartfelt, sincere. Like, and then you see the plane and you go, plane looks nice. Man looks nice. Okay, the, the barrier to entry into this story gets a little bit lower. I'm more engaged in the story now. Let's see what happens. We got in. <clears throat> He's on the left front. I'm on the right front. The other lawyer's sitting right behind me. And he started it up. And it started up just fine. Well, we taxied out. I said, should we pray? He said, yeah, that's a good idea. We normally don't. I said, well, this time we're going to. We normally don't. And I'm telling you, I prayed five, eight minutes. I prayed a long time. We went and got on the runway. He starts down the runway. The plane lifted off ever so gently, and we start climbing. And it's wonderful. Easy. Too easy. Not a problem in the world. We started climbing, and we flew probably three, four minutes. And something happened that will never leave my mind. It'll never leave my mind. The pilot turned to me, and he said, we're going in the clouds and I can't fly in clouds. They make me pass out. I said, clouds make you do what? <laughs> now, it's been cloudy all day. And we go right up into the clouds and you can't see anything. And he looks at me and his eyes roll back in his head. And he starts mumbling and he passes out. Passed out cold. Now I grabbed him and I shook him and I said, Come on, you gotta wake up so I can kill you. Now we're in the clouds flying along with no pilot. And my friend in the back seat said, We're dead, aren't we? I said, There's a very good chance of that, yes. He said, What are we gonna do? I said, I That is a scene that is just almost fantastical. Except for the credibility of the pastor who is telling this story, who has suspended the judgment bar one level two levels, now three levels. He had some easiness, and so he's praying. They get up, easy, take off. Okay, here we go, here we go. This is not going to be long. This is going to be okay. And then all of a sudden, the pilot tells him, I can't fly in the clouds. They make me pass out. Now, when you hear those words, do you think, <laughs> that's a good job? <laughs> well, you're joking, man. You, 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 you playing. You play too much, man. You, you, you play too much. Or when you hear those words, you're like, "Come on, man. What, what did you really mean? Are you serious? Are you serious? Like, there's clouds all around. What are we doing?" And the conversation between the lawyer and the pastor in this scenario, I think, is incredible. We're going to die. <laughs> well, you have a 99.9% .9 chance of dying. Oh, yeah. By the way, do you fly a plane? No, uh, I don't fly a plane either. 
do any of you guys fly planes out there? What is the likelihood of this scenario that if somebody does not know how to fly a plane, they will be able to land this plane? It, you have got to be up in the 90th percentile of the fact that you are about to die. You are moments from your death. And I'm sure that there are lots of things that are going through his mind. Listen to what happens in this story. I don't know. But there was a radio right there. And I handed him the microphone and I said, start asking for help. So he's in the back seat reaching up and he said, hello, hello. We didn't know any proper radio etiquette. All we were saying was hello. And somebody answered back, hello, hello. Don't you guys know proper radio etiquette? And I said, nope. I said Tell, we don't know nothing. Tell him we're in an airplane with a passed out pilot and we don't know how to fly this plane. The guy said, I'm a freighter flying out of Anchorage on the way to Tokyo. And he said, you're telling me you have nobody who can fly that plane with you? Said, I'm just wondering in this, did, did they at least grab the stabilize I don't need, I don't have any plane lingo either do they I need to get my buddy Joe Barr yeah I need to get Joe Barr to come in and evaluate this story and tell me what's going on here he's a pilot friend of mine he's got some cut-ins that you'll see from time to time uh on the Erskine music show but I need to get him because I don't even know like the joystick like whatever the controls are to at least stabilize that to the point where they're flying and like because I would think unless the plane is on autopilot then as soon as the pilot goes out, like the plane goes into a nosedive, kind of like we saw on Red Tails, like, oh, he got shot, uh, and he's gonna go in the nose. So, like, did they go into a nosedive and like pull it up and at least stabilize it? And it's like, okay, it's flying. I'm holding it here, but I don't even know what to do at this point. And like, when you get a plane to that point, is it like, like if you turn, like, if make minor adjustments, does the plane like start? So anyway, there's just a lot of things going on. There's a lot of things going on in my mind when I'm hearing this. To tell them that's correct. And in yours now you too. can understand, I am sweating bullets. Well, that certainly gives a sense of why people enjoy this show. Very engaging, very heartfelt. We will return to the conversation in a few moments. But first, let's thank our sponsors and you for all your awesome support. Moody Radio's Dawn and Steve Morning Show. Life Action Ministries. Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And Holt International. Thanks so much to our partners who make such a difference. Thanks, Jason. This is Don. And this is Steve of Don and Steve in the Morning on Moody Radio. You can find us online at donandsteve.org or you can listen through the Moody Radio app. And as friends of the Erskine Music Show, we always enjoy the variety of topics our friend has on his show. So on behalf of our show, thanks Erskine for bringing great Christ-centered topics to the people. All right. Let's get back to the show. This is where it gets good. First thing I'm going to do is start circling so I don't lose you. Because I'll fly out of range of your radio and you won't have me anymore. Mm. And he said, I'm going to get Anchorage Emergency for you. And Anchorage Emergency will be the people that can maybe help you. Mm, maybe. Try to save your life. After about five minutes, Anchorage came on and said, we understand you have a passed out pilot. And those of you do not know how to fly that plane. We said, that's right. They said, well, the first thing we got to do is find you. And I'll never forget what this man at Anchorage said. He said, my job is to get you home safe. Ooh. He said, that's my job. Mm. But he said, here's the deal. If you want me to get you home safe, you got to promise me you'll obey my voice. He said, you can't see me, but I can see you. Okay. And he said, if you're not going to obey my voice, you're going to die. When you can't see anything, you have no idea how disorientated you become. Finally, he said, okay, I found you. Now, hear me clear. He said, you're four minutes from a mountain. He said, you're going to crash in that mountain and die. Oh. Follow my voice. I never Shoot. said, I have to follow your voice? Is that reasonable? You see, I understood without his voice, I had nothing. And do okay. <laughs> We're starting to turn here on... The lesson for our day. The lesson for our lives. We're into the teenage years. But as a parent, and in life, you will go through the why stage. Why do we have to do that? Why are you doing that? Why do I have to be? Why do I have to do? Why, 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 why? Sometimes when we get to our teenage stage in our spiritual life, we get to the why stage. We've heard the Bible stories before. I was actually at a church this last week that had a flannel graph. And I saw the little people stuck to it. And I was like, I should just take the flannel graph and like 
no, but just take a picture of the monograph. It'll steal these people's property. But it was just so cute. We've gotten past the Bible stories in our lives. Listen to me today. You've gotten past the Bible stories. In life. You've probably been in church settings, church environments a number of times. You know the lingo. You know the, 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 the vocabulary. You know how to when to stand up, when to sit down, when to raise your hands, when to do all the different things that you do within the liturgy of the church or environment or the context that you have been in before. You've done those things before. There comes a time in our spiritual lives when we've read through the Bible stories, we've heard them before, we've heard certain passages preached before, maybe we start to ask God the question, why? Let me go a little bit farther because I don't think you heard me yet. There are some people who are asking the question, why does salvation have to be a substitutionary atonement? I'm uncomfortable with this now that I've been hanging around all these psychologists and it amounts to if God puts his own son forth to die for the plan of redemption, then doesn't that make God a cosmic child abuser? I don't think that I can follow a God who's a child abuser because after all, in our modern day and sensibilities, we eschew people who have those kind of mentally deranged perspectives about himself. And if that's what we assign to God, then obviously the substitutionary atonement of Jesus is not a doctrine that we can faithfully, helpfully teach in our generation. And you've heard things like that. Essentially, they're asking the question, why, God? Why does it have to be that way? Why did Jesus have to be born to die? And without the answer to that question being an unequivocal because this is the plan of God and the only way of redemption for us, then we're left on that trajectory toward the mountain on the precipice of our death because there is no other way of salvation. Let me go a little bit farther. Why do we have to speak with such care but also such truth as it relates to homosexuality and as it relates to the trans movement and the L and the G and the T and the V and the L M N O P, all the alphabet mafia that's out there. Why do we have to speak and hold these truths up? Can't we just let people love who they want to love? Like we're in 2024. Just let people love who they want. Just leave people alone. We don't have to be bound by this. We're essentially in our immaturity asking the question, why? Why, God, did you say what you said? Why, God, did you record what you recorded? I had this discussion with someone the other day who was saying, well, well, that, well, that was just Paul. I said, well, no, that was not just Paul. But if we don't consider Paul to be a part of sacred scripture, then we're going to be invariably just going back and just picking and choosing. Well, I like that from Paul, but I don't like that from Paul. I like that from Jesus, but I don't like that from Jesus. Essentially, we're making ourselves to be God. What shameful idolaters we are when we can look at the word of God, the unvarnished, undisputed, uncontested word of God, 66 books of the Bible, the indestructible, incorruptible word of God, and we can look at God and we can say, well, why did you write that, God? Huh, I could have thought of something better than that. I would have had a better plan of salvation than that. I mean, I'm looking at Jeremiah right now. Where does he? Why does he have to struggle? I mean, he cares so much for the nation of Israel. He's a weeping prophet. Can't you give him a better life? You read the book of Jeremiah and you see some of the things that God called Jeremiah to do and you'll go, why? But lest we just rest in that immature stage in our spiritual lives, listen to the rest of the story. Do you understand? Without God's voice, you have nothing. Nothing. Finally, he got us turned. And he said, I'm freezing all the traffic in the area. He said, it's going to take me an hour and a half to get you to Anchorage, and there's a lot of weather between you and Anchorage. You're in for a rough ride. Okay. And he said, I want you to hear me. I don't want you to look at what's going on outside. I don't want you to pay attention to the storm, just my voice. He said, if you start watching the storm, you will die. But I'll take you through it. Now, because they cleared all the traffic, several pilots, those nighttime freighters, those 747s started talking to us. They said, we're praying for you, men. You're going to make it. But listen to the voice. That's the key. They said, trust the voice. Do you realize your head is full of voices? And everybody in this world wants to talk to you. And everybody wants to be the controlling voice. And God says, I want you to be a living sacrifice. I want you to put yourself on the altar and let my voice be your voice. Finally, we went through the worst of the weather, but there was still more. Before we get to that, I'm not going to camp on this. I won't be long. I won't be long on this one. 
all of the different voices that are speaking to you today. Voices of your family, voices of your friends, voices of the people that you work with, voices of the things that you're trying to get accomplished, voices from the past, voice from, <laughs> voices from the future. There's all tenses and sounds of voices that you're going to experience in the course of a day. Voices of evil desires, voices of sin, voices of righteousness, voices of rebuke, voices of confession. So doesn't it stand to reason that we need to have some type of faithful way to evaluate all the different bits of data that are coming into our mind, voices that are coming into our mind, our self-talk to ourself, our self-evaluation of ourself. A lot of times we will put ourselves on the altar of destruction because we're listening to the wrong voice and it's not a voice and it's not even a voice that is coming from outside of us it's a voice that's coming from inside of us and we're telling ourselves we're self-sabotaging ourselves I'm not going to make it I'm going to be a failure I'm an imposter I'm a now I'm not going to give you too much in my book right now but this is in my leadership book I'm writing about this at not as we speak but in this season of life I'm writing about these things daily because these are the voices that distract us if we could boil it down to just one voice, if we could hear that one voice clearly, if we could follow that voice nearly and love that voice more dearly, <laughs> we will be a faithful child of God that finishes the race. Well, you probably already know that when you hear that sound, there's music on the way. After all, this is kind of a music show. Sit back and enjoy. All the music can be easily found on your favorite digital distribution channels. Turn up the volume and here we go. This is no game, it's no fairy tale. I stand right into a rifle barrel. It all comes down to this. Is he worth it? No dream, it's reality. They stole my love and my dignity. It all comes down to this. Is he worth it? This is where faith lives or dies. This is where hope comes alive.
This is Nick Ripkin. Welcome to the Erskine Music Show. And then the voice came back and it said, now, I'm going to line you up. He said, I'm going to bring you in right down the runway. And at the foot of the runway are some lights and they're in the form of a cross. He said, don't you forget this. The cross is the way home. Come on. Come on. Seriously. Finally, he's bringing us down. We still can't see anything. And all he kept saying is, stay with me. The cross. My sheep, the Bible says, hear my voice and they follow me. Finally, just a couple hundred feet off the ground, we saw the cross. I landed the plane. In fact, I landed it seven times. Whew. Man, that's a rough Finally, land. it all came to a stop. And the minute we stopped, the pilot woke up. The voice said, thanks for listening. I watch them crash and burn all the time because they won't follow my voice. Come on. They don't understand I'm the one who can see them even when they can't see me. Come on. But they get the voices in their head and they kill themselves. <sighs> they self-destruct. Thanks for listening to the voice. Then they put us in a motel room in about four in the morning. I knock at my door. And I open the door and a man was standing there, he said, hello, David. He said, you're the voice. You're the one who got me home. Do you recognize that voice? He said, I am. Do you understand one day you're gonna stand before him and say, you were the voice. You're the voice that brought me home. If you're not on that altar as a living sacrifice, your head's full of voices. And then we wonder why kids crash and burn. Come on. Speak to them. We wonder why marriages are shattered. Speak to them. And the Lord's saying, I'm the one who has the voice. All I can remember is that voice saying, stay with me. Amen. Stay with me. Don't listen to what's going on in your head and don't watch the storm. Stay mm -hmm. with me. That's good. All right. I'm going to pop out of that for just a second. And we just going to talk this up real quick because I'm in an hour and it's time to stop the show. Here's the deal. I was talking with somebody this, this week and they were, you know, they were excited about what it was that's going on in life. And in Erskine Music, we got a lot, we got a lot of cool, important things that are going on. I'm going to start promo for my book um, um, on leadership. I'm going to start talking more about the new single that's coming out, talking more about overseas travel and different things that are going on. And there's a lot of plates that are spinning. There's a lot of things that are going on. Erskine Music Show, we've got some incredible guests that are coming up uh, in the near future and and folks that I'm trying to get certain dates worked out. You're going to love the, the the roster of guests. I can't announce them at this point because we haven't got all the dates worked out and solidified just yet. But we've got an incredible roster of guests that's coming. But I was telling somebody, sometimes um, it's not even the achievement the voice of achievement, the, the voice of vindication, the voice of success that I'm listening to in life, but it's just the voice of well done, my good and faithful servant. If I can get through that day, if I can get through that season of life with all of the ups and downs and all of the unexpected things from my perspective, knowing that God sees me as he sees the trajectory that I'm going on, I told somebody the other day, I don't even know that I necessarily need to be, want to be, have a desire to be, um, famous in that sense, but I just want to finish. To those that I have met recently, uh, and I'll stop with this, when I was at high school graduation, I saw somebody that was in college, and I said, well, man, high school graduation doesn't mean very much to me because I want to graduate from college. When I was sitting at my college graduation, there were those who were receiving their um, master's degrees, and I sat there and I thought, well, my college graduation doesn't mean as much to me because I want to go and get a master's degree. And then when I sat there at my master's degree and I saw people who were getting a doctorate, I thought to myself, well, I want to go get a doctorate. Um, and the Lord d redirected my path and he was like, okay, the music is what I want you to do. I'm like, really? Why? <laughs> Why do I want to do music? I don't want to do music. You want me to do music. But when I do music, people are drawn to the Lord. And so I guess this is going to have to be about you and not about me. But I love doing music. It's fine. It's fine. It's okay. But... Um, just all that to simply say that the voice of success and the voice of what's the next level, the next level, the next level. Folks, if we just finish, if we just finish, that will be the ultimate success. If we just finish in our marriages, 
well. If we just finish in the way that we live our lives in a business setting or in a uh, communal setting uh, in our work, that is great. If we just finish as far as we can and as much as we can with those that we are in spiritual community with, just today, if there's any word that I can give you as we close out the Erskine Music Show, it is finish well. Finish well. The little clips at the very beginning of the show that kind of teases, hey, we're having a songwriter retreat in Nashville. It's coming up the first weekend in May, and we have spots open now. Applications are open, and if you're considering it, wondering what it's all about, this is a weekend that you do not want to miss. We are going to have showcases where you can share some music that you've written. If you've written lyrics or written a song or a part of a song, you can share that with other songwriters. You get to meet other co-writers and have that co-writing experience throughout the retreat. And then something that's really cool. I don't think people understand how amazing this is. We write songs over the weekend, have these incredible experiences, get so much encouragement, and then record demos of the songs that we just wrote in an award-winning studio with an amazing producer. Yeah. And this is just so much value for a songwriter if you're just beginning or if you're releasing some songs or if you're wanting to figure out what that even is come be in the room with these artists that have so much to offer so much encouragement and advice like you said sharing what has worked for you sharing what not to do get your questions answered by the people that know what they're talking about like i wish that everyone could uh, just be in the room and like a fly on the wall of some of these conversations. Yeah. And it, like, sometimes we have a great conversation and I wish it was recorded, but it's like those special things, those moments that just happen when you're uh, eating breakfast or we go for a walk or we're like having a break and you might just have that aha moment for what's next for you in your music right. career. Right. And just the encouragement to keep going, like you mentioned, it can get really isolating as a songwriter. And if you're a DIY musician and literally trying to do it all yourself, right you're missing out on that team aspect that we all need each other. And in a co-writing situation, you have different gifts and different voices and different sounds that nobody else is going to have. And it creates something beautiful that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I want to encourage every songwriter watching this to at least apply and get more information. Let us know that you're interested. And if you have any questions, you can ask us. We can send you more details on what the schedule might be like um, and make sure this is the right fit for you. We do want to let people know that it's a Christian retreat. We want this to honor God <laughs> yes, with no, everything that, that we do. That we need to figure that one out. <laughs> yes. And it's also for songwriters. So if you're not a songwriter or not interested in that, this is not for you because yeah, we literally no. are uh, spending a lot of time writing and talking about music. So if that's not yeah. your thing, uh, this is not just a hangout retreat. We are actually going to be creating some amazing things that will probably go around the world and will encourage and inspire people. So this yeah. is something that you do not want to miss. Come and be part of the co-writes, be part of the recording sessions, and be part of these songs that will literally go out to so many people. It's going to be amazing. So don't miss it. The Create Retreat is coming up this first weekend in May. So May 3rd through the 5th, 2024. This is the eighth year and man, you don't want to miss it. Like, what else would you be doing? Come on out yes. and be a part of it. You can sign up at the link below that's scrolling across the screen. Create yeah. songwriterretreat.com. Apply now. We want you to be there with us. We have come to the end of this episode. Don't miss a final word from Erskine. Hey guys, tell your friends about this show. And as always, I look forward to your interactions. Please contact us as you are able we love to hear from you. Okay, friends, let's go and make a difference.